Is this going to become like the premiere of Alex Jones? Like, yeah, yeah. that's where we're going. <laughs> Actually, it's the uh, it's the 18th premiere of Elon Musk. Let's get it oh, right. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. God. Hello and welcome to the ninth episode of Karl Marx's the 18th premiere of Louis Napoleon reading group series. Today is Friday, 31st of July, 2020, and I'm your host, Tom O'Brien. We begin Chapter 4, The Rise of Louis Bonaparte. This week, I have the new patrons, Chris Sammartino, Randy Freund, Alex West, John Robert O'Coin, George Q, surname, Zero Zero, and the return of Paul Golder Kelly. If you like today's episode, and want to hear more of this type of thing, perhaps you could consider becoming a patron. For only $5 a month, two patron-only episodes, and two patron-only live streams every month, the regular episodes a few days early, and the right to vote on the next reading group series. Before we join the discussion, a quick shout out to Cole, who edited the prefigurative politics episode with the red Plateus guys. Cole it's also helping me out with a couple of future premiere episodes. Thanks a million, Cole. Okay, to the discussion. This week, we are on to chapter four. We're absolutely flying through this. Now, this chapter, I've underlined nearly every single line. So, same as it ever was, gluttons for punishment. You know, I've just tweeted Elon Musk. I think he's listening. Hi, Elon. How's it going? Okay, let's go. Let's give it its full title here. The Rise of Louis Bonaparte. Okay, who wants to go first? Who wants to give a read? Let's do it. In the middle of October 1849, the National Assembly met once more. On November 1st, Bonaparte surprised it with a message in which he announced the dismissal of the Barrow Fallu Ministry and the formation of a new ministry. No one has ever sacked lackeys with less ceremony than Bonaparte, his ministers. The kicks that were intended for the National Assembly were in the meantime given to Barreau and company. The Barreau ministry, as we have seen, had been composed of Legitimists and Orleanists. It was a ministry of the party of order. Bonaparte had needed it to dissolve the Republican Constituent Assembly, to bring about the expedition against Rome, and to break the Democratic Party. Behind this ministry, he had seemingly effaced himself, surrendered government power to the hands of the party of order, and donned the modest character mask that the responsible editor of a newspaper wore under Louis Philippe, the mask of the Homme de Pale. He now threw off a mask, which was no longer the light veil behind which he could hide his physiognomy, but an iron mask that prevented him from displaying a physiognomy of his own. He had appointed the Barrow Ministry in order to blast the Republican National Assembly in the name of the Party of Order. He dismissed it in order to declare his own name independent of the National Assembly of the Party of Order. I mean, I like the the reference to the Iron Mask. Yeah, it was really and good. That- or he's like, oh yeah, like, you know, he's thrown off his light mask for the Iron Mask. Physiognomy. A mask now. off again. Mask off. I, I My, sometimes really wish that the economic manuscripts had these kind of sick burns in it. Oh, <laughs> it's so true that like, I guess what you mean, right, is, you know, capital. By the time he gets to capital, engaging with political economy just ruins his poetic style. So Marx is in the grand tradition of Marxists where engaging with all this scientific, you know, at the time, literature just ruins his literary skills. No, it, it it does poke its head out in, in in capital now and again. In volume one, it does. Yeah, yeah, but definitely, in no way does you ever see it ever in volume two, which is a goddamn graveyard. You might as well. There's like it. one or two lines that are really good, and that's in a very large book. <laughs> so getting on to this, so like, so what's he saying? He's talking about. When the assembly met again in eighty in October, he basically dis, he basically got rid of his prime minister and the cabinet and all those ministers and just kicked them into the long grass. And he ordered his own ministry. And so this was like a first sign of him displaying his raw power after getting everybody to letting the party of order get rid of 
the Social Democrats and the Pure Republicans. Now he was basically fighting with the party of order at this stage. And just to clarify, the Iron Mask reference is like the reference to the idea that, what was it, the king's brother was wearing the Iron Mask. Therefore, this is like a reference to his like royal executive power. I took it as a reference to the man with the Iron Mask. I yeah, 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 yeah. The prisoner who there have been numerous theories about, one of which is is that specific one. But yeah, you may be right that it's it's even more of a sick burn with that specific theory, but yeah. Which king's brother are we talking about here? Was Louis the Fourteenth? Uh, I want to say. He... Yeah, uh, Louis yeah, the yeah. Louis, Louis the Fourteenth. Yeah. What there's there's another the uh, theory that it was his dad. But uh, I, I think he's probably uh, making yeah. the reference to the like you know popular literature representation of it, which is usually that it's his brother. Um, and he's basically the king was keeping his brother with the iron mask on so he couldn't inherit the throne. I mean, yeah, because Marx liked Dumas and Steinhall a lot, so I was, I was, I'm pretty sure that's where it would have come from. Like, if this was written today, that'd be a gimp mask, wouldn't it? Let's be real. It'd be like <laughs> <laughs> his dominatrix <laughs> made him put on his gimp mask. <laughs> well, I'm not sure it works no, the same way. No, but that's, a, that's uh, a, a, <laughs> okay. Uh, well. And then there's the whole physiognomy thing, which if you if you know the rest of Marx's over, you know he's thinking, he's thinking something weirdly racialist there. Why? What do you think he's meaning there? <laughs> We're, what's so physiognomy? Like is that, is that a eugenics term? It's it's Proto. eugenics adjacent. It's like yeah, proto. -eugenics. Yeah, eugenics often makes reference to physiognomy. Even though physiognomy is something that way predates eugenics. So when you read Marx, you have to remember he was there are all sorts of racial remarks in Marx. And a lot of Mar I was reading the an otherwise good ed edition of the letters on the Civil War between Marx and Engels. But they try to pull the all his all his racial references were ironic card. And actually anti-racist, and it made me laugh so hard because I'm like, come on, Marx was not, he wasn't particularly racist for the time period, but like, he wasn't like born woke either. Like, oh man, I mean, it's a better defense to say he's having heated gamer moments, essentially. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> but yeah, I, I don't know if this is evidence of Marx's deep held uh, anti Corsican racism. Uh, <laughs> what we'll have to see about that. I, I think it's maybe more of a reference to Louis Bonaparte being quite uh, ugly, but you know, okay. yeah. Was Louis Bonaparte really ugly? From what I remember, yeah, he was like not really a very good looking person. I mean, I, know I knew you were a boner for Habsburgs, which is usually a bad sign for looking good, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's go into this part here. The Barifalu Ministry was the first and last parliamentary ministry that Bonaparte brought into being. Its dismissal forms, accordingly, a decisive turning point. With it, the party of order lost, never to reconquer it, an indispensable position for the maintenance of the parliamentary regime, the lever of executive power. It is immediately obvious that in a country like France, where the executive power commands an army of officials numbering more than half a million individuals, and therefore constantly maintains an immense mass of interests and livelihoods in the most absolute dependence, where the state enmeshes, controls, regulates, superintends and tutors civil society from its most comprehensive manifestations of life down to its most insignificant stirrings, from its most general modes of being to the private existence of individuals, where through the most extraordinary centralization of this parasitic body acquires an ubiquity, an omniscience, a capacity for accelerated mobility and an elasticity which finds a counterpart only in the helpless dependence, the loose shapelessness of the actual body politic. It is obvious that in such a country, the National Assembly forfeits all real influence when it loses command of the ministerial posts. If it does not at the same time simplify the administration of the state, reduce the army of officials as far as possible, and finally, let civil society and public opinion create organs of their own independent of the government power. But it is precisely with the maintenance of that extensive state machine in its numerous ramifications 
that the material interests of the French bourgeois are interwoven in the closest fashion. Here it finds posts for its surplus population and makes up in the form of state salaries for what it cannot pocket in the form of profit, interest, rents and honorariums. On the other hand, its political interest compelled it to increase daily the repressive measures and therefore the resources and the personnel of the state power, while at the same time it had to wage an uninterrupted war against public opinion and mistrustfully mutilate, cripple the independent organs of the social movement where it did not succeed in amputating them entirely. Thus, the French bourgeoisie was compelled by its class position to annihilate on the one hand the vital conditions of all parliamentary power and therefore likewise of its own and to render irresistible, on the other hand, the executive power hostile to it. God damn. <laughs> I, I actually was thinking about this line because I have a theory about a lot of French Marxists because they come out of France. I know that's redundant, but but something about <laughs> something about France seems to inculcate in people an absolutist view of the state going all the way back to, you know, the Sun King. And it really seems to come out here about how like you were putting all your power into the executive of the parliament and then like, uh oh, you gave it too much power, it's crushing you. Now let's run to this other power to contrapose it. But by doing so, lose all of our representary power because we work in an absolute state system. And as a side note, then, then it made sense to me that Foucault and Althusser came from this country. Bang. <laughs> yeah, it made me think of Althusser and also what I've read of Poulantzis, who I think draws on this kind of Althusserian notion of the state somehow embodying and being every kind of possible facet of power. And it's, yeah, it's, it's really interesting that you say that kind of that, that lineage of the absolute through the state. And yeah, there's a hell of a lot in this uh, <laughs> this pair. Yeah, it reminds me, like, there's an Irish kind of normal, well, a kind of left-friendly political guy who used to call Vincent Brown. He used to have a show on, and he'd be always talking to, like, the new MPs that would come in into the Dáil in Ireland, the TDs that would come into the Parliament. And he would say to them, they might be an independent TD from, I don't know, somewhere off in Connacht or something, not in a party. And they'd say, well, what's the point in you being in Parliament at all? <laughs> he'd, say, he'd say, you know that the ministries just do everything. They come in, they, they let you have a chat about what they're going to push through. And like, this, it's totally pointless. He said, your role is completely pointless. It's just money for you in your back pocket or something. <laughs> and like, I remember thinking like, God, oh, ah, it's a bit crude. But like, honestly, it's probably true. Like, <clears throat> and we see it here. It's probably why politicians, they really fight over ministerial positions. Because unless they have an executive position, they're essentially, you know, they might as well be on a podcast like us. You know, I think Marx is really saying something critical here about the organization of the state in bourgeois politics. You know, that I think it's pretty deep. Well, it's interesting because it doesn't apply to America. Hmm. Why not? Because our executive has our, our legislature has actual real counterpower to the executive in a way that it's not possible when the executive and legislative are combined. OK, and, that's fair. Yeah, that's fair. But and, then also we have a com the commander in chief thing. And so there's tons of executive power technically centralized under the president. It's more it seems to be more like the old Roman model than it does like parliamentary model. Like at all. Like, really, I think that leads people to misunderstand. But. Um, uh, I, I have a question. I have a question for you, Derek. Sorry to interrupt here. Like, okay. but like in the UK and in other parliamentary systems, the backbenchers can get through legislation, but it's just very difficult for them. Is it not the same in like the Senate or the House of Representatives that the senators can get it through, but unless the executive are supporting this, the power of the executive is that they generally don't get through? Uh, they can force it through. Like, but like, I mean, in practice, though, in practice, do they really ever get stuff through much? Historically, like, they did until it was more common during the 70s. It's also the same reason we don't have as many constitutional amendments anymore. Part of that has to do with partisan sorting in the United States, which used to be a lot less rigid. Yeah. Translate backbenchers for American listeners. Backbencher is probably like somebody who's not on a committee in the Senate or in the House of Representatives, just like a uh, bog standard elected person. The Senate in America seems to be stronger. They, they're they're kind mm -hmm. of all a yes. little bit stronger than backbenchers. Yeah, yeah so, in the, so in the, so in the UK, you have the, 
the, the front bench of the government and then the shadow front bench of the opposition party. And there'll all be people that will either be ministers or shadow ministers. And then there'll be secretaries below them and vice secretaries. And then there's usually a rump of people who don't have any role on any of those kind of committees. So Mac McDonnell and Corbyn are good examples. They, they were backbenchers for pretty much their entire careers, which gave them some license to kind of vote in ways that could be perceived to be, you know, voting their conscience because they were very rarely involved in any kind of ministerial or secretarial post. Um, so there's like a long tradition within English Parliament of, of backbenchers kind of being able to be within the parliamentary system, you know, quote unquote rebel figures. So, yeah, I don't know how that translates, though, to within like the Senate or Congress. Because our congressional committees are super important, but they have no relationship to the to our cabinet ministries at all. Right. Those are more formally separated than they are in parliamentary systems. Our Congress has not deigned to use it, but they actually do have power to rein in the executive unless the executive really wants to like start forcing the army in ways that are unconstitutional. Our mode of government, you could kind of see as like early bourgeois. Yes. It's not, and so it's, it's, it's different. It's more based off Roman Republican models as adopted by the bourgeois as opposed to parliamentary stuff, which is in my mind more purely bourgeois. I guess the overall point so, being expressed here is that the bourgeoisie finds it necessary to undermine the preconditions for its own role. <laughs> and I think that that's an interesting sort of Marxian theory that, you know, democracy basically incompatible with capitalism. You know, I think a lot of us feel differently about that these days, but all the same, I think that abstracted bit makes a lot more, makes more sense than the nuts and bolts of how you get there uh, in the American context. I also just wanted to call attention to the line here, the bourgeoisie finds posts for its surplus population and makes up in the form of state salaries for what it cannot pocket in the form of profit, interest, rents, and honorariums. So that I think definitely applies to the US, even if the other elements don't. Like, because, you know, the amount of like just griff horse trading and stuff that happens in Congress and, and all of the corruption and kickbacks and all that kind of stuff is it's you know very real yeah so <clears throat> one thing can confuses me about why this doesn't apply to the u.s because i read this as mark's talking about the the executive power has power over state officials and civil state officials right can't the president fire, you know, half of the CDC or whatever. I mean, didn't yeah. Trump fire like shit ton of science whatevers and the pandemic commission and whatnot? Yes. yes. Um, so I'm, I'm not exactly up to speed about why this doesn't our apply to- Our federal ministries are not that powerful though. Our right. states do what the hell they want. What all the CDC and these pandemic stuff and a lot of these executive cabinet functions, all they can do is advise. That would be the main difference. So, I mean, like, we're a hyper-federated system. And I, I think that's another thing that, like, makes us different than Europe because our, our, our federal executive is super strong on foreign policy and, and actually in ways that, they, that you're not in Europe. But Trump firing the CDC matters for, like, a lot of things. But at the end of the day, like, the CDC guidelines aren't even enforceable upon the states. There's no, like, they, they can't, constitutionally can't really do it. So... Let's think about how this would apply to, say, our own kind of wannabe revolution in 50 years' time or whatever the hell something might happen. Like, what does this say to us about the importance of executive power and how should we approach it as commies? I was going to just sort of echo the, uh, the consult consultatory role of, like, subcommittees and shit in the U.S., but in terms of executive power... Frankly, I think it has most import to us, you know, as pro-revolutionaries in the sense of the shape that the counter-revolution will take <laughs> um, and the kind of actually effective leadership that will be available on the part of the bourgeoisie in terms of having centralized sort of command over certain parts of the executive, the gendarme, not really the parts being discussed here, not the consultative-ish. Uh, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I don't think since he's not talking about executive power as such, or even the divisional between the executive and the legislative as such, but 
the specific division between them and also like the stupidity of particular parties and, and, and whatnot. I find it hard to draw any like real conclusions from it other, other than, you know, what's your step? And if you, if you train people to fight for you, don't act surprised if they start fighting with the same methods, but for their own interests later on. But like that's, that's so broad a lesson that I don't know if it diminishes the the very detailed critique he, he makes in this case, but yeah. Come to Sweden, we have very good executive uh, division of, uh, of powers and responsibility in, yeah. in official and political life. It does kind of put a damper on the idea that we could easily run a presidential campaign and lead to a revolution, though, as some people seem to have thought we could do. That it does, yeah. I, I think it says something more fundamental about the nature of power and executive functions, to be honest with you. Like, if you go back to the McNair reading group series, in that, like, McNair was talking about why the Soviets weren't a particularly useful tool for getting stuff done after the revolution, that they weren't in continuous session, stuff like that. Like, that there are certain things about executive power that if you had a revolution initially you're probably going to have executive functions of power you know it's not going to be immediately decentralized if we think about like what the dictatorship of the proletariat would involve it would involve some kind of body making executive functions about how we reorganize society so it says something to me specific about organizational function and the differences between them like, you know, it's one thing us wanting a uh, decentralized plant, Stafford beer, whatever, Marx's got the critique, the got the program, labor time, token planning society, right? And it's another whole other thing getting doing that 10 year step to actually implementing that goddamn total reorganization of society that on some stage there's going to be executive function, more than likely, you know, in that time period. So, like, I, I think it's saying, you know, something more than just look over your shoulder. I, I think you have to read this though in the context of, of like Marx's commentary on LaSalle and particularly when, when you realize that LaSalle was a crypto monarchist and, and thought that you could use the aristocratic hostility towards democracy as a way to battle bourgeois, bourgeois democratic tendencies. And Marx like thought that was dangerous in the extreme if you take the difference between marxism and lasallianism seriously it really does mean that there's a fundamental caution about over investing in the executive without that executive itself being somehow fairly democratized yeah the classical marxian answer that he derives in the 1870s from the paris commune is essentially the abolition between the separation of powers between the executive and legislative bodies, you know, in the American tradition. That sounds like tyranny, you know, but like uh, with regards to the Paris Commune, if you had something like an extremely representative democracy like the Paris Commune, or if you had some cybernetic form of direct democracy, you know, uh, a principle like that could be, you know, something emancipatory in a revolutionary Dick Prohl situation. There does seem to be something in the paragraph here, though, that kind of made me think that it is kind of instructive in terms of a longer term kind of strategic position vis-a-vis -vis how to deal with the executive. And it does seem like a call for, there's this the quote here about how you simplify the administration of the state, reduce the army of officials as far as possible, and finally let civil society and public opinion create organs of their own independent of governmental power. So that does seem kind of like a call for base building or building of parallel institutions within the society that can contend against power. Yeah, like he seems to be saying that like, you know, well, if I, you know, obviously he's saying if I was, if I was a goddamn party of order, I would never let him get rid of our ministries unless we totally dismantled every part of his power base in the state. So like, if we're thinking of getting rid of essentially, you know, the bourgeois state, I do think that's a, a well-made point. Well, if you think about the Muslim Brotherhood who had a dual power model of of organization and they still didn't do that because they knew they didn't have the capacity to run the ministries and they left it up to the to the military. Well, 
they're illegal and mostly in a prison I used to live across the street from now. So, you know, like I, I've seen this firsthand. If you don't take out the op- the apparatus of government and for, you know, all the weirdo right wing complaining about the deep state, they actually do kind of have a little bit of a point. In the U.S., like revolutionary language and even the whole mode of thought of, you know, overthrow the Constitution or something t- to save it, of course, it's all coded as right wing. <laughs> Yeah, we've we've kind of been talking about this in the beer reading group that we're doing uh, over on General Intellect Unit. I don't want to get too deep into it because it's a subject that, like, we're still working through the sort of groundwork of what beer's saying about organization and executive power, autonomy, centralization, decentralization, all that kind of stuff. But I, I think what I'm starting to see in Beer is that, like, he's not really in favor of a purely unitary executive legislative body for the reason that you need to have antagonisms in your organization that are going to mutually correct each other. Again, this is, I feel like it's, it's branching off into another discussion. I would say it's, it's not as simple as saying get rid of the executive we're going to have direct democracy. That's not really what Beer's agenda was. It's something a lot more complicated than that. Yeah, that's that was just an, a possible Beerian interpretation of a questionable Marxian tenet. Yeah, for sure. I, I feel like we need to do like a separate discussion about that, but uh, it, it's definitely a conversation I want to have. Because of I, what Derek was getting at with the sort of lineage of the absolutist state, the sort of like French political context stamping something really kind of simple onto Marx's political thought that the bourgeoisie destroys democracy to keep its own rule intact. You know, that hasn't always, hasn't always been my experience. You know, sometimes they can get away with hegemony or something, but like, it's kind of a very simple way of thinking about politics. So what this leads me to think a little bit about, though, is that this would have led to, like, some of the tensions in the First International that caused the anarchists to go get weird, because it it does seem like it's hard to reconcile some of what this implies about the executive and, like, both destroying and taking over the functions of the state while forming a parallel institution, while also still maintaining some democratic relationship to the existing state, while it's really hard to map out what Marx is actually substantively advocating for here. And as I've talked to with Douglas Lane a few times, it's hard to figure out when it's instrumental and when it's fundamental, it's really not clear. And so I now, like I now get how you could have people read this and get everything from Bernstein to Bordiga. Like it's really broad on what this would actually mean. And I guess my question is this, there's a hostility towards the state in this text that's that's different than some of the other texts. Like, like it, he calls eventually for like the abolition of taxes in here. So it, that's it's even hard to square with some of the demands of the manifesto. And and I just want to, if you think this has anything to do with that, I know we're all hitting a bunch of because we're all like this is coming up in a lot of our podcasts in different ways. And and so like it's like a crucial thing. It's also in like an otherwise seemingly boring part of the book, but still. Yeah, it's interesting. And it's a kind of a, a question I have for those that have read kind of beyond the major text, because I've only really read the kind of major Marxist text. And this seems like one of the instances where he is making kind of descriptive or kind of an analysis of the state. I was wondering beyond kind of the major text, does he elaborate? I know that there was the plan to write the books beyond capital where he would elaborate the state. But in Letters and Further Writings, does he go beyond what's in the Brumaire in terms of his conception of the state and how it should be dealt with, (laughs) essentially? Because from what I've read, what's in the Brumaire is a lot of the work that he did do on the state. So I was just wondering, you know, what you guys kind of, if there was anything further than what's actually here that could help nuance the kind of questions that Derek is raising there. Because it it doesn't, I, I completely agree that it seems like it's not entirely clear what he's exactly advocating for here. Uh, the two the two texts that I think it comes up again, and they're both about France. Um, is the Civil War in France and on the national yeah. of the land, and then his ba- and then all the battles with the Lasallians. But then trying to parse that with his battles with the Bakuninists makes it really strange and leads to like 
those tensions lead to weird stuff like George Soros. George Soros is, you know, he's there Soros. so long. Like so, he's got to be a lizard. Let's, you know, he's, no, he's definitely Soros. got to be a George Sorrell, like the the the, 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 the myth and violence guy. Like, I, I know that, Derek. I know that. I was making a joke. I am in, I am capable of joking. Now I am not. For I, I am not Irish. That's true. I, I, I kind of think that when we put up our next vote reading group series, I think the Civil War in France might be the next one. What do people think? I want to binge marks because I mean that's fine, you know. You know, there's not there's nothing we, wrong with that. <laughs> I really do think there's value in doing the Eric Olin right now because like mm. the divisions within the working class are so stark at this moment in the COVID pandemic, they've become so clear yes. and it's a matter of life and death. And that I think would be really good to look into as much as the Civil War in France is a good text, I, I, I really do think the Eric Golden Wright would be good to look into. You're, you're selling me. You're selling me anyway. Let's keep going. Will we keep going? Next, it's up to Emmanuel, who is getting prepared. He's getting his deep Swedish tones ready. Let's hit these couple of paragraphs here. Okay. Protocol I, droid mode. I, I, <laughs> Emmanuel, Emmanuel, I have a question for mm -hmm. you, Emmanuel. Do you drink mm -hmm. whiskey and do you smoke cigars? Uh, I do drink whiskey. I do not smoke cigars. Ah, I, it's, it's, it's been a long time. Andrew. Yeah, <laughs> you can you can uh, hear it in your voice. Your voice is when you actually read it, it drops with an octave. <laughs> it's really <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. That's that's actually kind of funny. It really does. <laughs> okay, intellectual protocol droid mode. The new ministry was called the Opul Ministry, not in the sense that General Opul had received the rank of Prime Minister. Rather, simultaneously with Barrow's dismissal, Bonaparte abolished this, this dignity, which, true enough, condemned the President of the Republic to the status of legal non-entity of a constitutional monarch. But of a constitutional monarch without throne or crown, without scepter or sword, without freedom from responsibility, without imprescriptible possession of the highest state dignity, and, worst of all, without a civil list. The Orpool Ministry contained only one man of parliamentary standing, the moneylender fooled, one of the most notorious of the high financiers. To his lot fell the Ministry of Finance. Look up the quotations on, on the Paris Bourse, and you will find that from November 1st, 1849, onward the French font, government securities, rise and fall with the rise and fall of Bonapartist stocks. While Bonaparte had thus found his ally in the Bourse, he at the same time took possession of the police by appointing Carlier, police prefect of Paris. Only in the course of development, however, could the consequences of the change of ministers come to light. To begin with, Bonaparte had taken a step forward, only to be driven backward all the more conspicuously. His brusque message was followed by the most servile declaration of allegiance to the National Assembly. As often as the ministers dared to make a diffident attempt to introduce his personal fads as legislative proposals, they themselves seemed to carry out against their will and compelled by their position, comical commissions, whose fruitlessness they were persuaded of in advance. As often as Bonaparte blurted out his intentions behind the ministers' backs and played with his idée napoléenne, his own uh, ministers disavowed him of the tribune of the National Assembly. His usurpatory longings seemed to make themselves heard only in order that the malicious laughter of his opponents might not be muted. He behaved like an unrecognized genius whom all the world takes for a simpleton. Never did he enjoy the contempt of all classes in fuller measure than during this period. Never did the bourgeoisie rule more absolutely. Never did it display more ostentatiously the insignia of domination. If we ever record audiobooks, I'm just saying, like, you're the guy. It's, it's like listening to a goddamn 1970s BBC Two documentary about, like, I don't know, wool making. If it was 1970s BBC, it would be like, only in the course of development, however, could the consequences <laughs> of the change in ministers come to light. Okay, let's parse that. So Napoleon essentially was pretending to make himself look like a fool, but really making the actual parliament look like fools. 
by put forward in like really daft proposals and making them debate it out and letting the stink go on them and letting everybody think, God, these goddamn parliamentarians are a load of rubbish. He's a sneaky bastard, essentially. This is what we're saying. All right. That part reminds me of Trump. I was about to say, it reminds me of the la- of all the Republican presidents of the United States since 1980, except for the one that failed, George Herbert, except for Bush Sr. I mean, because yeah. they all do this. They all would, they would all play the fool. Like, I used to, I used to think, like, how is W fooling people with his, like, down home stick when he comes from Connecticut? Sorry, Esri. Oh, and, no offense taken. <laughs> and, I mean, I know he's mostly raised in Texas, but, like, this is a Prince Hal act, right? And I was actually also thinking that, like, this is a this is a tactic that goes back way before bourgeois rule. Like, like it, Shakespeare brings it up. Like, pretend to be dumb, have Parliament do stupid shit while you're pretending to be dumb, and then discredit them. <laughs> like, and also win over people to your side because they think, oh, he's he's this person simple like us, and look at these eggheaded nincompoops over here debating this dumb shit. And like, it's a it's an effective strategy. Do other countries do? Has this happened as clearly as in the United States? Like, like I mean, John, Boris Johnson seems clearly to be doing this, but yeah, I was going to say he's the he's the obvious parallel. I mean, I, I'm always like nervous of the Trump Johnson comparisons, but in terms of like this line, he behaved like an unrecognized genius who all the world takes for a simpleton. <laughs> Good. But there are people, yeah, like, but in, in England, there are people because he's posh, they think he is an un, he's a genius. They think he's a genius, but somehow is a fool. And other people think he's a fool. Uh, yeah, it works both ways for him. But like, uh, you know, Sir Berlusconi did exactly the same trick. He would go to the Absolutely. European Parliament and he would basically, he would say to like some of the Germans in there, he's like, oh, yes, mine, mine Hitler. And he would like basically just do like jokes from like a carry on film. It was comical, like. It's our pure, pure bunga bunga time. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, this is such a perfect description of trolling because in the Swedish translation, it comes less across like he's pretending to be the fool and more more like Marx actually does consider him a genuine dumbass and like a real clown who nonetheless manages to win precisely because his own ministers laugh at him behind his back and his Napoleonic dreams or Napoleonic ideas, like his grand vision of becoming a... Uh, the new Napoleon or, or whatever. He, he sounds a, a lot more like heckling of Louis Bonaparte in, in the Swedish translation. It's not literal, but like between the lines, as it were, like the tone is, is more like judgy in, in a way or, or like diminishing of him. But I think the point of like, like the, the, the result of all of this is that his opponents just become more and more like they, they make fun of him more and more, which uh, and he becomes less and less popular with uh, with the popular vote, etc. But that that itself kind of made him stronger. Like I, w- w- when I when I read this, like it was, I just thought of Trump immediately. Like there was there was no <laughs> no way that my my mind wasn't immediately gonna wander in that direction. So one example I can think of in Canada of somebody who did this kind of routine uh, and was quite a master of it was uh, Ralph Klein who is a premier of Alberta, uh, enormously popular and very clownish. People still sort of tell stories about like being at the bars and seeing him just drunk off of his ass, you know, just absolutely shambolic in his behavior. I think he once like was just out of, down on the street downtown and he like a- assaulted a homeless person when he was drunk. And like, it's, it's just, you know, really, really just crude behavior. But everybody, like, I used to go uh, canvas for the Social Democratic Party. And you talk to people and they say, like, you know, oh, I loved Ralph. Ralph, like, he was the guy. Like, I could I could sympathize with Ralph. I, you know, like, maybe I'll vote Social Democratic. But if Ralph came back, you know, back from, back from like, his obscurity, uh, then... Uh, I'd be on Team Ralph all over again. Um, and he did a lot of sort of like Bonapartist kind of things too, like just like giving money out of the oil revenues to people to like buy them off. The, the, the interesting thing there is that like we kind of like have a system where the leader of the dominant party in parliament will have pretty much all the power. So he wasn't using this to play off against 
parliament so much as he was to just kind of monopolize the media and and create this uh, incredible public performance. But you know, he was he was a real master of that. Aside from that, I just wanted to touch on that thing about the idée Napoléon. This was a thing that Bonaparte had been doing for a long time. He he sort of like wrote op-ed pieces more or less or like kind of like idea pieces that he would get published which were vaguely sort of like Saint Simonian but with a really strong executive focus on like basically monarchy and this current of thought that he initiated at like was really influential after he got in power in cre- like rebuilding Paris and so on and actually continued to really be a current in French politics like down to the present this idea of like a super powerful bourgeois executive that does a lot of state action and state intervention in the economy. So it was kind of a joke because he was just sort of like this crank on the outside writing these op-ed pieces, but it did actually end up having an effect in the long term. Yeah, we could talk about this all all day because it's, you know, the last X, you know, 50 years of mostly right-wing populist politics. Yeah, I was, I was going to um, say I could come in and kind of compare experiences I had canvassing in the 2019 general election with some of Carl's experiences with Johnson, but I think there's some paragraphs coming up that, that highlight it even more clearly, <laughs> kind of what I was getting on the doorstep. On this episode, you heard the team tune The Order of the Phronic Jesters and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. The artwork for the show was created by the Korean artist and author of the 2019 Marx Engels illustration book. You can check out links to his work and Twitter account in the show notes. Thank you for listening and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science and Swampside Chats. Thank you.